Are you born again? Do you bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit in your life? How to know if you're saved and born again? How to know that you're a new creation? That's what we're going to cover in today's lesson. What's up? I'm Pastor Brian with Empowered Christian Ministries, here with another lesson from our Driveway Discipleship Program, empowering you to be a better follower of Jesus in just 10 minutes a day. Let's dive in. The fruit of the Holy Spirit is the natural and inevitable outworking of God's presence in your life. Were you born again, made a new creation by the Spirit of the living God in you? How does His presence affect how we think? feel, live, act. So we're forgiven of our sins through faith in Jesus and his death on the cross on our behalf. We're saved by who he is and what he did, not by who we are and what we do. But that doesn't mean we won't change. We will. But we're changed as a result of having already been saved by God's grace and by receiving His Spirit, not by our obedience to God's law. In Galatians 5, the Apostle Paul talks about the fruitless and enslaving pursuit of trying to be saved by our own good works. Verse 1 says, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. We aren't to be enslaved by the law anymore. However, while we do have a new spirit inside, we're still living in bodies of our sinful flesh. Our body and our soul, which is our mind, our will, our emotions, and our desires, these still have sinful desires and selfish passions that are contrary to the will of God. Sinful desires must be put to death, and sinful passions of the flesh must be forced into submission. The Holy Spirit desires to lead you, and He transforms us from the inside out. Live according to the Spirit. Galatians 5 verses 16 through 18 says, Walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. The law of God served as a schoolmaster to know what was right from what was wrong. It was good, but it was limited. First, because they were always guilty of sin, needing continuous atonement for. And second, because they just had to obey the law to the best of their ability in their weak, natural human strength. But now we have freedom from the gospel that has set us free from sin, death, and hell, and authority over Satan, and the guidance and power of the indwelling spirit within us. All of these things ensure victory over sin. Not as our goal to attain, but as our foundation to rest and live from. Romans 8, 5 says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. So know, identify, and crucify the works of the flesh. Galatians 5, 19 through 21 says, Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, 
jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Other examples are listed in Matthew 15, 19, 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 10, and Colossians 3, verses 5 through 6. Uh, you can also see uh, Revelation verse 20, or, uh, chapter 21, verse 8. So these are all evidences of still being unsaved or of having really false beliefs that need to be corrected and evidence of a part of you that is still broken that you need to bring to the Lord to heal. Or it's something that you're doing in disobedience to the Lord instead of submitting to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Verse 24 there says, those who belong to Jesus Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So commit yourself today to crucify it. Lastly, you need to know, embrace, and cultivate the fruit of the Spirit. Verses 22 through 23 say, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. In future lessons, we'll examine each fruit separately, but here's a brief overview. Love is the sacrificial giving of yourself to others, putting their needs above your own. This is foremost love of God, followed by love of neighbor. See Matthew 22, verse 36 through 39, 1 Corinthians 13, 13, John 15, verses 12 through 13, and chapter 13, verses 34 to 35, and Galatians 5, 13. Joy is deep internal gladness that first comes from God within and then it culminates in an external outward expression. It could be reserved or energetic, quiet contentment, or noisy shouting and dancing. It's all fueled by delight and appreciation for God. Peace refers to both the inner wholeness and well-being and rest of the soul that's now in right relationship with God, as well as the pursuit to forgive and reconcile with others. Patience and faithfulness are about trusting in the gospel and in God, in his sovereignty, his trustworthiness, and in his perfect character, will, and timing. Selflessness is again evident and manifested in the fruits of kindness and gentleness, wherein our perspective of others and our personal character and our disposition are then changed in such a way that it affects how we treat others. Goodness, uh, also called righteousness in Romans 14 verse 17, is about divine justness. It's about being godly and morally upright and like God. And lastly, self-control is now available to us and it makes it possible to overcome every sin and obstacle by the indwelling presence, guidance, and power of the Holy Spirit. See Ephesians 3.16 and Philippians 4.13. So the fruit of the Spirit is the natural and inevitable result of God's presence. In other words, these things are the natural outworking of God's attributes. Wherever God's Spirit is, 
he is. And his attributes will manifest outwardly as a result. Whoever has God's spirit in them, these attributes will naturally and inevitably flow. For example, 1 John 4 a teaches that God is love. And anyone who does not love does not know God. If we know God, we will know love and become loving because he is. It's essential that we know who God is through Jesus and the Bible and then cultivate our relationship with him by spending intimate time with him through prayer and worship. So if these fruits aren't greatly evident in your life, you need to inspect yourself. Humble yourself. Repent of your sin and or your waywardness and draw near to God in desperate hunger for more of him. Stoke the flames of your desire to glorify him with all of your life, to give Jesus all of your trust as your Savior and all of your life as your Lord. Continually invite the Holy Spirit to consume and change your innermost being and to operate in and through you. And as Galatians 5.25 says, If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want more of you. Fill us with your Spirit that we may overflow. Help us identify and crucify every sinful desire of the flesh and abundantly bear the fruit of your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you would like a free two-page PDF of this lesson, as well as a couple of action steps to get started to help examine your own life and just make sure that you're crucifying these things and really walking and bearing the fruit of the Holy Spirit in your life, just click the link below or visit empoweredchristian.org forward slash driveway dash discipleship. And I'd be happy to send you a copy of it to your email. If you like this video, please like it and share it with someone. And be sure to come back tomorrow to do another lesson. As always, be empowered and go advance the kingdom of God today. In Jesus' name, God bless.